Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. All right, Fortress on Hill listeners, we, uh, we have had a great run with guests, as, as you guys have known, uh, especially, you know, I think as everyone's been home and on the Zoom and getting used to it, we've really had some great people come on the pod. And today's really no exception to that. And in fact, this is a pretty exciting interview. Uh, we have uh, Ali Sufan, who is on the pod for the first time. And, you know, Ali, I've, I've got to tell you that it's a bit strange speaking with you today. It sort of takes me back to a, maybe a decidedly disturbing, but I think kind of formative moment in my own life and, and Henry's to a certain extent as well. I first really read about you as a quite pivotal figure uh, in Lawrence Wright's then kind of buzzing and critically lauded book, The Looming Tower. That yeah. was 2007. And, and I read it in a filthy and, and pretty austere combat outpost in East Baghdad, which had actually been a Saddam uh, air raid shelter at one time. It was midway wow. through a, a tour as a scout platoon leader during the early surge. And uh, it, it felt like a kind of a profound time and place to be burning through that book, you know, among all the other books I was reading. And it, it was really striking. And I sensed it was kind of an important moment. So it's really quite cool that we've cross professional paths and i just want to thank you for coming on before i introduce your basic bio no thank you and uh, thank you for uh, your service um it's an honor to be with you guys today I, you know i really appreciate that and and the same goes to you because certainly we were very much in the same fight uh for a long time and, and overlapping by just a bit in fact so yeah. no ma many of our listeners are probably familiar uh with you ali but uh for those who aren't, uh, Ali is a, a chairman and CEO now uh, of, of the Sufan Group and a leading national security and counterterrorism expert. Uh, previously, as an FBI supervisory special agent, he investigated a lot of pretty prominent cases that most folks have heard of who are old enough. You know, the East Africa embassy bombings, the coal attack in Yemen, and of course, all the events surrounding and you know, proceeding 9-11. Uh, he's also serving as a member of the Homeland Security Advisory Council and the author of two books, one of which we're going to talk a lot about today, uh, Anatomy of Terror, From the Death of Bin Laden to the Rise of the Islamic State, uh, and the New York Times Top 10 bestseller uh, that we're really going to focus in some on, The Black Banners, The Inside Story of 9-11 and the War Against Al-Qaeda, Declassified. So, you know, nine years after the original release. And uh, that won the 2012 written our book prize. So uh, finally, Ali has uh, testified before the U.S. Congress, the British Parliament. Uh, he's also contributed to and been profiled, uh, well, everywhere, but 60 Minutes Frontline, The New Yorker, Washington Post, New York Times, among others. And you, you may have seen him on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and the BBC, and now audio on Fortress on a Hill. Um, so that probably barely scratches the surface of your life. But Ali, we're just really pleased to have you on the pod. And thanks again for making the time. No, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Danny. You know, I, I guess it's convention that says you start with background and bio. And, you know, but I, I, I think it's more than that for me. Uh, having encountered you in 2007, as I mentioned at the start, you know, then right after I got back from Iraq, I had read Jane Ma uh, Mayer's The Dark Side. Uh, which was covering a lot of the same issues. And I got to say that both of those books uh, and your role in them were sort of shocking, maybe more than they should have been to me, uh, potentially, I guess, as a New Yorker from a firefighter-heavy family, 
and neighborhood, losing quite a few soldiers in Iraq just before, and Doring, which, you know, was built, of course, on a lot of the in- bad intel and even false pretenses that you discuss. Sure. But your but your story, you know, resonated with me, I think, especially this idea that, you know, you were fighting two battles, external and internal, and the fact that there were other people who felt that and were doing their best gave me a lot of hope. But, you know, some of the questions I'm going to ask today involve the journey after, you know, because my critique, at least, uh, got much more systemic, uh, maybe a little darker. And this idea that there's a real balance between the relative merits of reformism and policy and structural overhaul. And we'll get to that. But before we go there, you know, I wanted to ask a little about your early life and and influences and, and what experiences and values led you to the FBI, even if accidentally, as you sort of describe on a whim. Uh, and besides like an early 2006, seven profile in the New Yorker, there's not a whole lot, I guess, about your childhood or youth in the book or front loaded on, on the internet. So if you're comfortable with it, you know, would you take us on just a very brief tour of that early life journey, be- beginning in Lebanon, perhaps? Sure, sure. Um, I was born in uh, Lebanon. Uh, just before the Civil War started. I was born in 1971. Um, So um, then, uh, you know, we uh, went through a civil war. Uh, Most of my childhood, uh, I thought uh, chaos and civil war is a norm. Uh, I didn't know any better. Um, You know, at the time, maybe people can read about Beirut in the 70s and the 80s as as probably one of the most uh, dangerous places in the world. Uh, but for me, it was home. Um, you know, we went to school, went to the beaches, went to even camping. Um, and when there is war, we just try to figure out a good hiding place. And usually it's uh, the stairway of the building, the apartment building where we live. And you wait until the battle is over. Um, and then, you know, we get a couple of invasions. You had the when the Syrian invaded in the 70s and when the Israelis invaded in 81. So I kind of like, you know, lived through all this. And eventually my family um, immigrated to the United States. Uh, I went to Pennsylvania, very different outside Philadelphia, you know, suburbia USA, very different than, you know, the, the, the environment that I came out of from in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, in Pennsylvania, you know, I kind of um, loved uh, the quietness, <laughs> you know, something uh, it's weird probably for your listeners to see, but I think you know what I'm talking about coming from Baghdad back home, realize that, wow, this is, this is different, right? So, um, and then I went to uh, school in Pennsylvania, I went to college in a uh, small little uh, town called Mansfield, PA, it's, uh, north central Pennsylvania, about 50 miles north of uh, Williamsport, where they do the World uh, uh, Series, uh, you know, uh, Little League World Series. Um, beautiful area, quiet. Now, people were amazing up there. Um, and I went to a small school because I wanted that. I wanted that personal relationship. I always look to kind of like, I, I don't want to be a number. I don't want to be a big, you know, go to a big school where, you, you know, even your professors don't know your name. And then after that, uh, you know, I was really active in college. Um, it was an amazing uh, environment. Uh, I was uh, part of a fraternity. I was involved with student government. Uh, uh, it was a small community, so we kind of tried our best to make it better uh, for the four years that uh, we were there, me and a lot of my friends and, um, and fraternity brothers and so forth. And then I went to graduate school. During that time period, uh, a couple of uh, people in uh, my fraternity were into law enforcement and, and uh, wanted to join the, uh, the FBI. Uh, so people applied. And as a joke, I applied to see how long I will uh, stay in the process before they tell me thanks, but no thanks. I had no interest whatsoever in law enforcement. Uh, my only national security interests were 
basically my graduate work at the time, focusing on the impact of non-state actors on uh, geopolitical stability in the Middle East. So I was really interested in studying uh, non-state actors and terrorist groups, groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda wasn't even, you know, uh, an entity at the time, uh, a known entity. And uh, so uh, with my luck, I was the only one who actually got accepted. Every time they said, go and take a test, I went. And um, every time they wanted to do an interview, uh, I did. And uh, two years later, um, they basically offered me uh, a job with the FBI. At the time, I was getting ready to do my PhD. And I was going to Cambridge in the UK. Uh, the average age in Cambridge for a PhD at the time was 36. I was 25 years old. So I thought, you know what? One of my favorite shows on television at the time was uh, The X-Files. Uh, so uh, I thought, hey, you know, I can go to the FBI and see if there are aliens out there. <laughs> uh, it was kind of like out of a whim, literally. I thought even if I stay 10 years in the FBI, I can leave and I'm still, you know, in an okay average age to continue my PhD. And I joined the Bureau, so uh, the best thing that I've ever done and uh, the rest is history. So I, I guess I won't ask, you know, because it's probably still classified whether you actually found out if the X Files was true. <laughs> no, I cannot tell you that, you know. Yes, no, yeah. and of course, it, I guess. There, there's <laughs> some show on a history channel about aliens or something like this. Maybe you can watch it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, trust me, I think everyone has that aunt at Thanksgiving who just has to talk about aliens. <laughs> Uh, and I certainly have one. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk about Lebanon and the Civil War. I've always kind of had a bit of an immersive, long-time side interest, but I'm sure I'm still a bit of a neophyte and it won't embarrass myself. But it must have been, in one sense, a person would think that it's so intense, it's so formative, and that's true. But as you described, it was kind of your normal. And... I mean, I know that there's a degree of culture within Lebanon that I've read about, you know, tonight we party because tomorrow we may die in this. But it's interesting because you left, I believe, at 16 years old, which is just as the Civil War is kind of getting towards wrapping up. So you really did straddle the whole the whole experience of that war. And I was thinking about the experience of coming here and jumping really full throated in, in, into American culture, middle America in a sense, in, in Pennsylvania, which can have that feel in the areas you're describing. But it was interesting because at a number of points, and we're jumping a little bit of ahead, but I think it's an interesting point. You describe some of the problems that we'll get to regarding enhanced interrogation techniques, other harsh techniques, torture even, and and you often use the phrase un-American. And so usually you make uh, twin assertions of the book. I think there's like four times that crop up, you know, in towards the end of the book. And the first assertion is usually, listen, you know, torture and other cruelty and pettiness, they don't work and they're counterproductive. But also, you know, you use the word these actions are un-American. So I was wondering if you could, you know, explain a little bit about how you came to view, you know, true Americanism and, and its values and whether the transition from Lebanon into the United States and then also then into the federal, you know, law enforcement institution, uh, how that all kind of formed together your view of what's American and what's American. Well, they are all, as you correctly mentioned, Danny, they're all connected to each other. Um, I mean, you know, Lebanon for me was chaos, civil war, death, uh, you know, um, Granted, I didn't know any better, but when I came to America and I saw the alternative, I kind of figured it out, right? So America is is based on laws. America is based on a constitution. It's based on that social contract between the people and between the government. It's based on, you know, something we call the Bill of Rights that gives you the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, all the amendments, all the Ten Amendments with everything that's inside them. Um, and, and for me, when I say something un-American, that is, that means it is something that totally contradicts everything 
I came to love and I came to learn and I came to defend uh, the Constitution that I swore to defend against enemies, all foreign and domestic, as you did and as everyone who served did. So for me, it was very clear. Um, if it's not, if it does not fit in the shining city of the hill, on the hill, then it's not American. Um, we talk about human rights. We talk about liberties. Uh, we talk about democracy. Now uh, we talk about, um, you know, helping people to self-determine their future. Uh, that's what we fight for. We fight for the good ideals. So when we start doing something that contradict with these ideals, then this is un-American. In 2002, when we were torturing people, we were writing other countries in the world for doing the same thing we were doing in black sites. Um, we wrote up countries in 2002 State Department report on human rights for, um, you know, uh, sleep deprivation, for nudity, for uh, you know, temperature manipulation for detainees. Um, and we were doing the same thing. Um, if we say something is bad and we um, accuse other of doing this and kind of like punish other countries for doing the same thing to their people, it does not mean that it's right for it, for us to do it. Uh, changing the name of torture to enhance interrogation techniques doesn't make it right. You are in Iraq and you've seen that the images of Abu Ghraib caused more foreign fighters to join the insurgency in Iraq than anything else, gave a new blood for Al Qaeda. Um, we never had um, uh, hostages being put in orange suits or being tortured before we start doing um, you know, that in, in, in black sites. So living according to our values, living according to our uh, moral standards, according to our laws, is not only a brand. This is what America is. This is the, corner, the cornerstone of our foundation. And when we lose it, we lose our position in the world. And when we lose our position in the world, America is not going to be the shining city on the hill uh, that we love and we admire. And, and I think that's why, for me, I know the alternative. I lived through the alternative. And it's horrible. And that's why all these ideals about America, the ideals that took us through World War I and World War II, it took us through the civil rights movement, it took us uh, uh, through the Cold War, and we're always victorious. Uh, we're always on the right side of history. I think these are worth fighting for and worth defending. And I believe that when I was putting my life on the line, as you guys did, that's what we were fighting for. We're fighting for our buddies. We're fighting for our colleagues next to us, our, our, um, our, uh, our friends, um, fighting for our country. But that's what our country means. We're fighting for the right thing. You know, I, I really liked throughout Black Banners in particular, the way you always linked, uh, and in everything I've seen you do, the, the legal values, with principles and with ethics and keeping them all sort of together. And the, the oath is important. I mean, the oath you is have to. I mean, you cannot have our ideas and our morality and our legal system contradict our tactics and strategy because it's going to be a disaster. If your strategy does not fit with your, with your uh, you know, moral core, then you're going to fail. And, and that's exactly what happened during the war on terrorism. That's what happened in Iraq. That's what continued to happen in so many places around the world. Look, you have somebody like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's probably one of the worst uh, murderers in the 21st century. He killed more than 3,000 Americans on 9-11. He has been in custody for how long? For 13, 14 years, maybe more? Um, in, in Guantanamo Bay, we cannot even prosecute him. And he admitted on camera that he was behind 9-11. Um, this is because what uh, he went through when he got arrested for, you know, we didn't save any lives because of it, the torture that he won, the 183 sessions of board boarding, it's going to come and hunt us when we put him 
in front of a judge. So that's why he's just in a Guantanamo Bay and justice is not served. Our legal system, our morality, our values need to be in sync with our tactics and our strategy. And when they are not in sync, they're going to cause a big problem for us. I mean, Sun Tzu said, um, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you will win 100 times in 100 battles. So when knowing yourself, meaning knowing everything about you, to include your core values, and knowing your enemy, knowing everything about them, how they operate, how they recruit, how, how you can defeat them, not only in the battlefield, but also in interrogation rooms. Unfortunately, in this war on terrorism, we didn't take our time to learn about our enemy so we can defeat them, and we forget about who we are. So it was a double negative, and that double negative did not cause any positive outcome. That is such an important point, and, it, and I think it really threads through everything you do when you discuss these values and, and legalities and, and the hypocrisy. One of the important points you brought up is the blowback. And I remember Abu Ghraib very well, and you gave so much great backstory on how that was systemic and it followed from Gitmo and all this. But I remember that and the effect that it had when it catapulted around the world digitally and then you know other examples which this wasn't necessarily policy but to see the blowback the blackwater shooting of the civilians in baghdad happened yeah. when i was in baghdad and i felt that because those guys went back to their base and their nice salaries and their their internet and and i had to live with the the blame because we were all americans and so that really stood out to me and it, it but it kind of leads to my next question which i, I think you were very fair to folks from what I could tell in Black Banners. I mean, it did not seem like one of these tell-alls that is a personal vendetta at all. And that struck me because that usually tells me something about the, the validity of the argument. And, you know, it took nine years, right, from the original publication of Black Banners to the declassified version. And, and there are some key details, as you pointed out, about how and why torture doesn't work that you couldn't necessarily put out there. But if I can ask you to speculate just a bit, uh, to what extent would you attribute the original redactions to any of these, you know, few things, uh, actual national security risks or partisanship and ideology or fear for institutional reputations or, you know, personal pettiness among the officers? I mean, to what extent was it a balance of all those things and where do you think it leaned most heavily? I think it's uh, personal and institutional pettiness. Uh, that's that's what I truly believe. Um, and you can look at the sections that were redacted back in 2010. And uh, so, sorry, back in 2011, and look at uh, the unredacted version now and compare them to each other, and you'll get to the same conclusion. Whereas the national security, um, uh, you know, imperatives in redacting pronouns, redacting he and she and me and you uh, in a book. Uh, that, is, that is pettiness. Um, I think um, some folks at the agency at the time, at the CIA, viewed uh, the book as damaging uh, to their own reputation. Not to the reputation of the CIA in general, but the reputation of the people who were basically behind the torture program. And they use their powers, they use their position to, um, um, to um, kind of prevent that book from coming out. And also they used it to, um, you know, censor the book, um, distort the facts by using classifications. So distortion via classifications uh, and redactions. And I think that's uh, that's what happens. But interestingly enough, I think um, it fired back in a way, because again, that's what America is all about. The truth always come out because we have a system. Some people might abuse the system, but eventually they're gonna get caught. And ironically, those who sought to impose their own version of the facts, they ended up 
doing the truth a great service because my account um, was classified based on national security grounds. So if my account had not been true, there would have been no grounds to classify it for reasons of national security. So, you know, now when you read what happened, you actually can know without doubts that my version of the story is the truth. When you see a sentence that said, after sleep deprivation, and then it's redacted, and then you compare it to what the current declassified version is, and you can actually read the whole sentence without the redaction and see that it actually said after sleep deprivation, not a single uh, uh, piece of intelligence uh, was obtained, you will know that sleep deprivation did not work. Because if I was lying, they could have said, he's a liar, right? You cannot classify lies. Uh, but they classified my own uh, personal firsthand account. And, uh, and, you know, that's what's great about America, because the truth came out. Um, they, they tried to, um, you know, kill the truth, suffocate the truth, censor the truth, classify the truth. But, you know, eventually it came out for everyone to see. Well, uh, I know I speak for Danny and myself when we know the the fact that it is now completely um, unredacted that you're able to talk about your firsthand experience was was very very powerful. I uh, saw there the um, the expose in the New York Times where they compared them side by side between pages of the Black Banners in 2011 and from today, and you know I'm I'm not prior intel or anything but but you had to really ask yourself is that you you can't tell us that all of these things needed to be taken out it, it, it to me it seems a a, a clear cut connection to uh retribution uh, against you and, and against the truth in general about the torture program and about uh the global war on terror yeah um so I wanted to give you just a, a, a drop of background on myself because I have I have uh, some law enforcement stuff I'd like to chat with you about. I was a uh, I was an Army MP for six years, um, did two tours in Iraq, uh, training Iraqi police, and uh, I also spent um, two years as a drug investigator with Army CID. So I I, I ended up getting out, and uh, you know t today I'm disabled, but for a very long time. Um, your career or a similar one in Army CID was was kind of my personal goal. Um, I wanted to talk about your portrayal in The Looming Tower. It showed in vivid detail how major changes between the Clinton and Bush administrations changed priorities in UF, U.S. efforts with regard to fighting terrorism. But something that I feel most people don't wrap their minds around is the effort investigators put in to attempting to solve the case and the and the the series did show that i think uh pretty well overall um but you know most americans have the csi mentality it has people believing that it's it's all wrapped up neatly after an hour when it's incredibly hard sometimes grueling work the long hours spent at the office often in front of a computer screen typing or out in the field for hours or days at a time chasing leads, returning phone calls, interviewing witnesses and suspects, often with little rest or, or time with loved ones. And I believe it's a, you know, a very immense but a rewarding part of being involved with police or, or you know, the uh, law enforcement in general. Um, yep. and, and, of course, it, uh, doing interrogations, not from a, a torture or co coercion mindset, but one of trust and rapport, that, 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 that connection between people is very important. And you could see that very clearly in many spots in the book, how little things that people you spoke to now understood that someone who knew their culture, who had lived a portion of their culture, was talking to them, and they had to change tactics. And, of course, your story involves flying thousands of miles, working with many different agencies and foreign governments, all in the pursuit in the pursuit of making the right connections between all these sources and, and hopefully saving people's lives. 
So when I see the admin change from Clinton to Bush and suddenly leader priorities have changed, and although certainly, you know, the Clinton administration made their own mistakes, uh, certainly in the years prior to, you know, Bush uh, being inaugurated and, you know, you going after Al Qaeda using old fashioned beat the pavement police work, work that you and others like you were making huge inroads in identifying threats. Um, you know, the entire the wide web of Al Qaeda was finally coming into view because of your hard work. So my question is, during that time, you know, that that you know, say between 98 and, you know, post 9-11, how did you and your colleagues stomach these changes in policy? You know, granted, you did depart the FBI pretty shortly thereafter, um, but I'm curious about that initial time um, from when Bush was elected to the reality that Al-Qaeda was a known threat pre-9-11 and could have been stopped, to the invasions of Af Iraq and Afghanistan, certainly decreasing the chances of success in finding and stopping Al-Qaeda, seeing all your hard work and the hard work of your colleagues being diluted and marginalized, some of whom, like your friend John O'Neill, who lost their lives in the wake of this failure to act. There had to be, I imagine, a, an incredible sense of anger or betrayal at seeing these efforts preempted and the lives attached to those efforts being tossed in the file cabinet. As, as I, watching the series, was incredibly ang angry on a powerful level on your behalf, and I wasn't even involved. Right. I mean, it is difficult to, to live through that time period. And, um, and frankly, this is one of the reasons that I decided to, to write the Black Banners. Uh, for me, it was therapeutic in so many different ways. You know, 9-11 is an event that changed the world. And um, I had my firsthand account of uh, this event and a lot of the events that led to that tragic day. Um, so during, before, and after 9-11, uh, there are a lot of, you know, incidents that took place, a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, political um, uh, developments, uh, national security developments, uh, a lot of failures, a lot of successes. And, and we had to go through policy changes, um, you know, eventually, you know, early on, just before I joined, there was a problem in the U.S. government in uh, considering that uh, former uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan can be a threat to the national security of the United States. Uh, in 1993, for example, the FBI forced uh, a case to be shot on on Omar Abdul Rahman and his his followers, and that led to the, the uh, 1993 uh, bombing of the World Trade Center with the, the Ramzi Yusuf, uh, um, you know, plot. And then after that, people started to realize, you know what, maybe those guys can be dangerous. So let's open the case on them and see what's going on. And we infiltrated the group and uh, we were able to disrupt uh, a plot uh, called Terrorist Stop, which basically stopping, uh, you know, a terrorist attacks on bridges, tunnels, uh, 26 Federal Plaza in New York, which has the FBI offices, the federal building in New York, and the UN building. And uh, this is when Omar Abdurrahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh, and his followers were arrested and prosecuted and put in jail. Uh, this is what made people realize that maybe we should focus on Osama bin Laden. Uh, that guy has contact with some of the people who were involved in terror stop and involved with Omar Abdurrahman. And at the time, again, people in the U.S. government who are looking at him as a financier of terrorism, not a terrorist operative, uh, but some folks uh, in the CIA and the FBI um, wanted to go beyond that and see what he was up to in Sudan. And uh, they were able to realize that he was actually building a network and it's a very dangerous network. But again, when the East Africa embassy bombings happened in August of 1998, we had a pushback. Uh, they said Osama bin Laden never did an attack against the United States. 
uh, never did a terrorist attack. So, you know, there is no uh, substance for you to claim that you think Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were behind it. And this is where, you know, John O'Neill and I were pushing back and saying, look, look at the language and the claims of responsibility. Compare it to Bin Laden's threats. Look at the 1998 fatwa that he issued in February. Look at his uh, interview with ABC News uh, back in uh, in uh, in May of 1998, which basically was published or broadcasted in June of 1998. Was John Miller? Um, you know, it is him. He now did what he warned us uh, of doing, and again. Uh, it was difficult to to have people believe that it's Osama bin Laden who did it, and it was more difficult to even figure out to retaliate against Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. And even when they retaliated, it was, you know, for the lack of a better term, half-ass retaliation because uh, at the time everybody was focused on Monica Lewinsky and the blue dress. And any kind of uh, counterterrorism operation in Afghanistan will be viewed as wag the dog kind of thing. And, you know, and unfortunately, um, it is, uh, you know, politics, maybe it's worse today, but it used to be like this before. So, you know, people who are against, against the Clinton administration were saying that basically downplaying the terrorism threat. Um, when the USS call happened, it happened around an election year. And uh, it happened on October 12th um, of uh, 2000. Uh, November was the presidential election between Al Gore and uh, President Bush, candidate Bush at the time, Governor Bush. And um, at the time, there was a lot of things going on in the Middle East. Um, the Israelis were surrounding and bombing Arafat's headquarters. There was demonstrations and different places in the Muslim world against Israel and sometimes against the United States because of that. And then um, people in the Clinton administration decided that they don't want it to retaliate because of all these issues. And they wanted to basically know for sure that Osama bin Laden did it. And Henry, you are 100% accurate. It's not like an hour and everything will be packaged and we we'll give it to you very clear. <laughs> it was an investigation. I was there from day one. You know, we're working hard. We're finding connection to Al-Qaeda network. Um, you know, um, and I was there investigating on the ground. I am a Bin Laden Al-Qaeda at the time investigator. So the fact that I was investigating means that we believe that it was Al-Qaeda. Um, in November, we were 100% confident that Al-Qaeda and uh, Bin Laden was behind the call attack. But then you have an election that went all the way to the Supreme Court and people did not want to uh, talk about the call or talk about the 17 sailors we lost in the Gulf of Aden. Um, they were more you know, focused on chads and, 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 and counting ballots in Florida. And uh, when the Bush administration came, um, unfortunately, uh, there are some people who believe the press clippings about Wag the Dog, about terrorism in general. Uh, the Attorney General at the time, if you remember, um, Ashcroft, and he basically did not believe that there is terrorism. And he wanted the FBI to focus more on violent crimes and crimes against children rather than on terrorism. Uh, he said so at the SAC conference in, uh, in Quantico. Um, so people started to believe the partisan press clippings um, from before the election. And uh, not a lot of people were really interested in what was going on. Um, we tried to push uh, for uh, an audience on a high level regarding the USS call, but unfortunately, Nobody was interested in that. I talk in the story about, in, in the book, about a Senate delegation that came in June of 2001 to Yemen, and we briefed them about the call. And after the senator left, his chief of staff stayed, and a couple of my colleagues were with me. And he basically said, look, you know, nobody in Washington wants to know. You know, the White House does not want Bin Laden to be behind the call. And we were shocked to hear that. Um, because that's not our job. <laughs> our job is to give facts and to give evidence. Uh, it's not our job what to basically couch what the White House wanted to hear. 
And uh, the guy said, look, we disagree with the White House on this issue. Um, he was basically, you know, also a Republican senator, a Republican staffer. He said, uh, we disagree with the White House totally, but we can see their points. They are saying that if you say bin Laden was behind it, then um, the president has to do something about it. If he doesn't have, if, if he doesn't do anything about it, he will look weak. But if he does something about it, half of the country is not with him because they don't think he's a legitimate president. So it is an awkward position for the White House. And at the time, my position was, look, you know what? I moved him from the door and opened the door and said, this is way above my grade level. Um, and uh, I left the room. But that is in June of uh, 2001. Um, so after 9-11, when uh, the 9-11 Commission asked uh, Wolfowitz at the time, uh, uh, Assistant Segda, uh, why the administration did not retaliate, uh, you know, against uh, the people who did the USS call, he said it was a stale case. He called it a stale case. Well, I don't think it was a stale case for the Navy. I don't think it was a stale case for the Pentagon. I don't think it was a stale case for the families of the 17 uh, souls we lost uh, on that day. And I don't think it was a stale case for us who were basically going from one threat to another in Yemen, trying to investigate it and arrest people who were involved in the attack, and we successfully done so. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a perfect example of how politics sometimes get involved with, you know, get in the middle of our views, of our understanding of, of, of the facts. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that I wanted to, to write the book, uh, because these events in so many ways changed the world. And, uh, and I think uh, having a firsthand account uh, is very valuable uh, to uh, conversation, not necessarily in our lifetime, but maybe down the road, maybe in the future. And that's why, as, as Danny mentioned, I was very fair. Um, you know, I wasn't political in any way, shape or form. Um, and I just put the facts out. Uh, you know, I wrote it like an FBI agent write a report. And I put just the facts, uh, what every, you know, the good things the people did, the bad things people did, um, and how everything evolved to what it is today, and how the threat evolves over the years, from bin Laden issuing statements against the U.S., to the East Africa embassy bombings, to um, uh, the Millennium uh, operation in Jordan and in other places, the Millennium threats, to the U.S. Askol attack in Aden, to, to 9-11. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone, anyone who you like, might think might be affected by it. Young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for females and minorities and inflicts on minorities around the globe, and anyone else you think it might affect, please take a moment, pause the episode, share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to, uh, to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So, let's bring out these honorary producers. And they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P, 
Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, Tristan Oliver, Marwan Marwan, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can always contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Forsana Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com. Make sure you check for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Well, thank you for uh, definitely for being willing to go through that process of creating that first-hand account. I'm sure it wasn't easy to do that, and especially carrying it through from its original publication to its now unredacted form. I, I, I can be certain that, that that wasn't wasn't easy to go through. Um, to lighten up the discussion just for just for a second here, I want to talk about the sometimes Keystone Cops aspect of Al Qaeda and other terrorists. Uh, reading in the book about the um, plane that uh, Riddy bought for uh, an Al Qaeda um, for Al Qaeda to use, that getting no maintenance, forcing him to come back to fix it, finding uh, melted tires, an engine filled with sand. Uh, no one was able to find the ignition keys. And I asked myself, are, are these guys Al-Qaeda's finest? Or are they American soldiers I served with on deployment who routinely caused that much damage, you know, if not more? Um, you know, military life is, is replete with broken or missing equipment caused not by combat or legitimate training, but by inattention or just outright incompetence of, of the average soldier. Um, I saw Humvee tanks that uh, very clearly run on diesel, get filled with regular unleaded gas, uh, wheels falling off the trucks you know, during a convoy, uh, a 50 cal machine gun mount falling into the lap of a gunner because he didn't insert the retaining pins correctly. Um, I just, I found it, I found it absolutely hilarious. And I, I wanted to share that small amount of satisfaction knowing that the other guys do it. Although I doubt Al Qaeda would uh, dock their pay to cover the costs. Um, but I was curious to ask you, were there any other instances of terrorist folly that kind of stuck with you and you just had to laugh about or, or took solace in otherwise very serious investigations? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, story after story, in almost every investigation that we were doing, we used to just look at each other and say, like, you cannot make that shit up. I mean, um, like, for example, before the USS call, um, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda wanted to, uh, they have an operation called the ship operation. So they have the ship operation and they have the planes operation. The planes operation was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed you know, basically, we know what happened on 9-11. And then the ship operation, at the beginning, they wanted to attack a ship, a military ship, in also refueling in Aden around the millennium. Uh, and um, there was a ship uh, docked on uh, January 4th, I believe, or 5th of 2000, in the uh, port of Aden, Yemen. It's U.S. as the Sullivans. And the plan was to basically blow it up. Um, that was, you know, they, that was the operation that later became the USS Cole. So they get the same boat that they use on the Cole, the same explosives, and then they decided to basically take it to the beach area and uh, put the water, put the boat in the water so the two suicide bombers can, uh, can actually sail it and hit the ship. And um, they did not know anything about tide. So basically the boat sunk when they put it in the water. Uh, so the two suicide bombers uh, decided that they couldn't move the boat. It uh, it's really like sunk on the beach. So they decided to go home and sleep and not to die. And Nashri and the guys who are videotaping the operation are sitting on the observation deck, uh, a place that they rented, an apartment that they rented, um, overseeing the port with the camera waiting for the operation to happen so they can videotape it. And nothing happened. So now sure he goes to the safe house and he sees the two guys sleeping. <laughs> so he woke them up. He said, what happened? Basically, they said, oh, yeah, the boat sunk. So there's nothing we can do. We came back home. <laughs> so they decided not to die. 
So, uh, so the guy naturally in the morning uh, he goes with the two suicide bombers to show to show him where the boat is, and then there is a couple of people sitting there and playing with the explosives, right? Literally on the beach, throwing it, playing it with each other. So that was the night of destiny, Laylatul Qadr, they call it, uh, when the attack was supposed to happen. So Nashuri goes and he says, hey, this is my boat and this is my, uh, my stuff. So the, the young guys who were playing with the explosives, thinking that it was marijuana, <laughs> they said that, uh, no, we prayed uh, for Allah uh, during the night of destiny last night to uh, send us uh, send us money, and God sent us this today, the boat and everything <laughs> in it. So this is ours. So now they have this argument where Nashri actually had to buy the boat and the engine from them. And he wanted to take the explosives back to the guest house with, with the boat. Now they cannot move it because it's really heavy and it became heavier because all the explosives were wet. So they go to the main road next to the beach and they stop a big Yemeni military truck and they ask the guy if he can move the boat for them with the explosive in it. And the guy did move the boat and they take it to the guest house. A military truck <laughs> moved the boat because they gave him a couple of bucks for, for the guy. He had no idea that there was explosives on the boat or anything. He thought that he was helping a couple of guys that their, their boat sunk. And he moved it to the safe house, and then they keep it in the safe house, and they run away uh, to Afghanistan. Um, and guess what? Nothing happened. Uh, nobody was looking for the boat. The Yemenis were not tipped that there was something going on. So they came back. They uh, dried the explosives. Definitely by then it's dried. They fixed the boat, and uh, they tried to do it again. And this time the USS called. But to just hear every step of the way how, you know, they get this military truck, they moved it using military, um, you know, uh, Yemeni military, you know, vehicles. Um, they, they sunk the boat. They, I mean, all these kind of things. Um, it's just like you, you can't, you, you just look at yourselves like, there is, these guys are really idiots. Yeah. Another thing with the, uh, with the supposed, the alleged, um, um, dirty bomb, you know, uh, basically, you know, they, the guy believed that he can do a dirty bomb and he can enrich uranium by putting uranium in a bucket and uh, spinning, spin the bucket so hard. So when you spin it, then you'll enrich the uranium. And he was briefing it to one of Al-Qaeda leaders, Abu Zubaydah, we believe even he briefed it to KSM, uh, that that's how they will enrich uranium. Now, you know, imagine that's how they are thinking. This is a thinking process. We get some uranium, we steal it from a hospital, put it, put it in a bucket and just spin the bucket so hard, you will have enriched uranium. We build the dirty bomb and we, we destroy the sea. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that when you're doing and you're investigating and you're getting to, to, to all these kind of things and hearing about it, sometimes it's, it's difficult not to, you know, control yourself and start laughing. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Um, so yeah, there are dozens and dozens of these stories. A dirty bomb indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like one day, you know, we, I, I just wrote a report, we sent it to DC, and then two days later, I'm still at uh, overseas, we're still in the middle of the operation watching CNN, and then everything on CNN is about a plot on the uh, the government, the U.S. government disrupted a plot on um, the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm like, wait, wait a second, is this, so I ask, is this, is this the stuff that I wrote? Because I just wrote about the Brooklyn Bridge. And then I found out that, yes, it is our, my report and my report, you know, became a plot that Al-Qaeda was, was, was doing on the Brooklyn Bridge and we disrupted it. And I'm telling you, I would like to take the credit for disrupting a plot on the Brooklyn Bridge, one of my favorite bridges. But the whole thing is one guy was telling me all the stuff that he knows about operations. So, 
So after he said all that information about or intelligence about you know operations that he was involved in, I said you have to remember about everything you heard. So if you're sitting with some people and we're talking about a plot or we're talking about a target, you have to tell me. So he was you know saying yeah you know once we were sitting in the guest house and one guy mentioned something about something. So we put that something about something, regardless if it's aspirational, if there is uh, you know, any capability, if they were serious, if it was a joke, it does not matter. We put all these things. So one time he said, oh yeah, this guy uh, wanted to, uh, one day we were watching uh, at the guest house uh, uh, a movie. And then we saw a bridge uh, you know, being destroyed. Uh, you know, it's a Godzilla movie. So Godzilla went on a bridge and a lot of people died. And one guy said, oh, imagine if we do this, how many Americans will kill? I said, okay, do you remember what a bridge? Oh, no, I, I don't. It's just like, did you guys discuss it afterward? No, 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 just, just there. That's it. That's everything that the guy said and everybody was just like laughing. And, and I said, so we wanted to know what movie. It's a Godzilla movie. We went to the Godzilla movies. We found out that it is the Brooklyn Bridge, right? So he said, yeah, this is a movie, a Brooklyn Bridge. So basically, that is a report that was written. Two days later, wow, a huge disruption um, that we did. And we saved the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. I think we saved it from Godzilla. I don't know. <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's on both sides sometimes. You just like shake your head and, you know, keep focusing on the job because, you know, we're there to save lives. We're not there to play the politics or whatever people were doing in D.C. at the time. Well, it's it's good to know that not only do we share some of the same enemies, but the sort of dark and sarcastic and need for humor that yeah, soldiers have. Yeah. You have to, come on. I mean, I'm sure you, you know, in the middle of, you know, facing great dangers, you had to laugh your ass off about something. That is, that's how you survive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every moment of levity you can find. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the soldier and the FBI agents, uh, you know, defense mechanism, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to. And, uh, and sometimes it's, it's a small joke, but you start exaggerating it in your head and making hands and tails and legs for it just to make it funnier. So you and your buddies can laugh more about it. But that's basically, uh, that's basically what we used to do. And in, in, in places like Yemen, we, we used to operate a lot at night really at night when, you know, I mean, midnight, so we're, we're doing uh, operations and, Something about in Yemen, a lot of people don't turn their headlights on at night because they believe they are saving gas. <laughs> so that was like the biggest joke for us when we were driving and you see somebody driving on the wrong side of the uh, road, literally the wrong side of the road because it's closer to the, to, to the exit they want to take with no lights on. And, and, you know, something silly, something stupid. But, you know, eventually it becomes something hilarious. And that becomes like the funniest thing you've ever seen. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's so funny how the, sometimes the cultural differences can be a joke in and of themselves. And, and it's, it's, it made me think a little bit as I was reading some of, some of the narrative. I mean, one of the things, and, and it's true, right? This isn't just flatter the guest. Your book, it's a long book, Black Banners, but, uh, but I burned through it. And, and not just because I was doing a Goodwill Hunting impression, but because <laughs> it really has that narrative, almost fictional feel, like, like it could be a novel. And maybe that, that, I think that's why it reads so well. But at the same time, I kept asking myself, wow, this feels cinematic. And I wonder if he felt <laughs> like he was living a movie. And so we're kind of big fans we're a bit of film buffs here on the pod. And so are a lot of our listeners. Uh, sometimes we break down movies and I'm sure you get it a lot, but just in a vague sense, I've got to ask you about the siege 1998 Bruce Willis. I, I know you're familiar with the film. I've read things saying that, you know, the Tony Shalhoub character was loosely based on you. And I know a lot of that becomes mythology, but as I was looking at a lot of your internal struggles, like the fight within the intelligence community, 
and within the government, there were moments where I was wondering if you had a, if it felt cinematic, but also there were lines in the book and lines in the movie that are, you know, they're not similar in a sense that they're copied. They're just, the tone was similar or the issues were. And so like on four set page 472, you talk about general Miller and some of the kind of Kafka, Kafka-esque policy absurdities at Gitmo. You say, you know, the same was true of his bosses. They wouldn't let a detainee use a phone for a minute, which might've led to bin Laden, but they didn't mind disregarding the U S constitution. And in the movie, you know, which I, I think got kind of forgotten until 9-11 and then it was the most rented, you know, Denzel Washington's Agent Hubbard character gives a bit of a soliloquy and he says, you know, what if they, what if what they really want is for us to herd our children into stadiums like we're doing, you know, and put our soldiers on the street. And then I like the line, he says, bend the law, shred the constitution just a little bit, because if we torture him, then, you know, essentially everything that his soldiers died for is over. So uh, I guess I'm asking, you know, was there a, a cinematic feel to some of the experience, the sense that you were involved in profound things that, you know, like you said, you can't make this shit up. But also, did you feel a little bit like at times a, a lone wolf in, in some of your fight? You know, I know you had a lot of colleagues who agreed with you, but there had to have maybe been times where you felt like the only sane person in the room. I guess, heck, what I'm asking is, were, were you lonely at all, Ali? I mean, during this journey? No, not at all. Uh, I never felt lonely. I, uh, I am probably the person who spoke up and wrote a book about it. Um, I mean, few others are still in the government or just left the government. So I am sure maybe they will do whatever, you know, they can and, and, and put these things up. But no, I, I never felt lonely. I, I think I get all the support that I, uh, I can get, uh, not only from the FBI and the FBI leadership, from Director Mueller and the team up in, um, you know, FBI and, and, and in New York, but also from DOD. Uh, I get a lot of support from DOD and I get a lot of support from the CIA. A lot of the CIA officers, as you see from the book, uh, um, were basically on my side. And actually, they are the people who's like, look, you're the FBI. <laughs> this this kind of things cannot be done. You guys need to do something about it. Um, so I never felt lonely, no. Um, as for the other issues, I mean, look, when they were making the show, The, uh, the Looming Tower, I, um, you know, I, I talked to the executive producers and they were talking about things and how they want to do things. And, and I said, look, you know what? Reality is way better than fiction. Uh, I said, there is no fiction that you guys can write in Hollywood that matches the reality of what we went through. And, uh, and I think that's why sometimes you see, you think it's a movie. Um, as for the siege, I'm going to tell you an interesting story. It was in, 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 uh, in an event with Lawrence Wright. And, you know, Larry, who wrote The Looming Tower, is the one who wrote The Siege. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes, actually, I was, right? It was his story and, and co-wrote the screen, screenplay. Is, Super interesting. It, yeah, it, it's his story. Um, he wanted to do a screenplay, what's going to happen after the Cold War, blah, blah, blah. So he came up with this idea of terrorism. Uh, and uh, that's why they call him the prophet because he also wrote a book just came out at the beginning you know just came out at the time of the pandemic and it was about a pandemic and it was about a virus very similar to COVID-19 and what we're experiencing today so yeah he's uh, he has this prophetic uh, you know sense to him so Larry, I did not know him until after 9-11 when the FBI had me talk to him when he was working on the Looming Tower. But uh, Larry basically came to the JTTF, came to New York, and they were, you know, taking him around when he was doing research for uh, the siege. And, uh, and he asked, you know, do you have like an Arabic speaking agent or something like, oh yeah, we have one. Uh, they were talking about me. He's like, can I meet him? He's like, no, because he does undercover and stuff like that. So yeah, he's, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to meet him. But they gave him a little bit of information about me. And this information actually made it to the Tony Shalhoub character. So Larry was talking about how, you know, when he was doing the siege, he heard about me and he did that movie. Uh, with my character in it. And later on, interestingly enough, uh, you know, it was, you know, a person that fits that character who was standing with his FBI bosses. Uh, you know, the guy who played Denzel Washington is actually uh, the guy who was the head of the JTTF at the time in New York, my boss, Pas Pasquale DeMora. 
Um, so, you know, Denzel was actually Pat Domaro. Um, and Pat was a guy who basically I went to <laughs> when we were in the dark side, seeing all these stupid stuff that's being done in our name. And uh, Pat went to Mueller and basically he said, we don't do that. And Pat's position was very similar to Denzel's previous position in the movie. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes you know, fiction and reality collides, and um, and more often than not, they are colliding uh, with what uh, Lawrence Wright writes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's interesting to to see this unfold in front of you. Well, I, I appreciate you talking about that. I I, I find. <laughs> You know, the, the, the fiction truth link is very interesting. And I agree that in many cases, I wonder sometimes when I watch a movie that I know a whole lot about the topic, I understand creative license. But there are times when I say, man, they didn't really need to change this. There are, there are so many stories that are true that, that are oh, yeah. better than these fictional ones. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and sometimes, honestly, uh, you know, like, I know in the Looming Tower, for example, there's a couple of things that they changed. And it's like, why did you change it? They said, because if we put it, nobody will ever believe that this is actually what happened. I said, but that is exactly what happened. They said, yeah, but we need to make it more believable. So this is one of the incidences that I was actually shocked that Hollywood is actually toning it down because they believe nobody will believe it. <laughs> <laughs> now that's instructive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that gives you an idea about the life that we lived, right? <laughs> yes, yes, definitely true. I, I felt the same way about many war movies when they do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, this has been <laughs> super. You know, I, I watch a, a lot of your appearances and everything, and uh, you know, they they vary, of course, depending on the medium and all that. And and I appreciate some of the the, the depth and backstory that you've gone into here. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of close this out with uh, just kind of one more question, you know, taking into account that we've all got a million things, and I'm sure you're living that Zoom life uh, like me and Henry are, but maybe even more. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate the calendar. But uh, you know, I'd asked in the last question if you felt lonely, and it was interesting the way you, you answered because it struck me as you were saying it that there are a lot of protagonist in the book it's it's not like you you were trying to impart that you're a lone wolf or that you were the only one who saw it uh some of your bosses were like you mentioned you know pat uh, which i did not know that the denzel character had any connection to him that's super cool but there were points where i was really impressed with some of the fbi hierarchy but as you mentioned there were cia folks who were on your side and and really had these doubts and i know you've made that argument I get so much support from the Pentagon. Sometimes even when people in the FBI were like, you know, we really don't like Ali and Pat and all these people as much, you know, much because they convinced Mueller to pull out from these sites. We should have been there. We should have been with the CIA trying to figure out what's going on. We're left out. Uh, you know, you had people like this, but it's amazing the people in the Pentagon who used to come, every rank you can imagine. And they tell you, you know what? Keep speaking up. We have your back. Thank you. Uh, because they understand. They understand that these things will probably result in our soldiers being treated the same way if they get caught. Um, so, so uh, and then they have the Army Shield Manual, and they have a lot of rules and regulations, and there's a reason we have all these rules and regulations. So we, we, I get a lot of support from the Pentagon. But as, as you see from the Black Banners, the CIA, I mean, a lot of times, you know, during this nine period, nine uh, nine years period when the book was classified, um, they, they made it appear as if it's FBI versus CIA. And it was never an FBI versus CIA. It was FBI and CIA versus outside contractors that charged two contractors that charged the US government $83 million to put water on people's faces. Um, it, it, you know, and, and then you see the details of how these things evolved and you see the disastrous outcome that it led to. Um, so now people can see uh, why um, I always supported the CIA officers, even when I testified in Congress. They will see when, why I said, let's turn the page, but let's, you know, not, not you know, I, I spoke highly of the CIA people who were there, even at the sites in uh, my very first op-ed on this matter in, in April of 2009, my tortured decision in the New York Times. 
And some people like from the human rights organizations, they were attacking me for doing this. Some even people from the FBI were saying, why are you defending these people? And I'm just like, it, it was a very difficult thing for me because I'm, I'm not defending them because I'm trying to cover for them. I'm defending them because it's the right thing to do. When people try to do the right thing and they fail, you should basically stand up for them and say they tried. And, and when, when it falls on your shoulder to be the person who is telling the American public the truth, you have to tell them the truth. And that truth, sometimes, as you mentioned earlier, is very much complicated. It's not wrapped in one hour. We don't live in a world of black and white. We live in different shades of gray. And, and sometimes when you want to discuss the truth, it does not have a Hollywood ending. Uh, it is confusing. And it, it, it gets you to a point to basically um, be very conflicted in a lot of the stuff that you're doing and you're saying. And that's why I tried to you know, be very uh, accurate and very fair in the black banners. And you end up pissing off people on both sides, but that's fine because I didn't write it for anybody on any side. I wrote it for, for the truth and for the American public and for the history. And, uh, and I think hopefully now they know the difference between the truth and the difference between conspiracy theories and raw emotions and partisan talking points and alternative facts or whatever we have these days. And uh, that's why I fought for nine years for the truth to be uncensored. And I thank the CIA and I thank the, the current leadership of the CIA who, um, you know, allowed uh, this un uh, censorship to end and who basically exhibit um, a rare sense of transparency in allowing the black banners to be declassified. You know, and so that that is that is interesting that the book was declassified, as you mentioned. That's pretty rare, and and that struck me. Uh, my la my last kind of closeout, I think, is obviously on the toll, and at, at every step in in the book and in this conversation, uh, there's no sense that you feel sorry for yourself or you think that you're a singular figure. At the same time, I've found that personally to an extent, but especially from our regular work with some whistleblowers and dissenters, um, that like you mentioned, purely happy Hollywood endings or medals awarded for courage and moral battles. I mean, to some extent, they're a rare thing, usually. Uh, more typically, there's serious professional and social and sometimes even legal costs when you take a principal stand. And at the end of Black Banners, you explained that you, you knew you'd either give yourself a heart attack from the stress or you would have to leave the FBI. And you've also noted that some, some folks had told you that you were a marked man in certain quarters at the end of your career within the government. And furthermore, I've read about the Saudi disinformation campaign or the probably Saudi disinformation campaign against you of late, some of the internet trolling and you know, probably very off-putting threats. And given your close relationship with uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, and similar abuses he was subjected to, I, I can only imagine or can't imagine the stress and strain. So if I may ask uh, about the personal toll, you know, career-wise in, in truth-telling, but, but also in your post-bureau work, what, what, has, what has that journey been like? Because there's been 15 years since you've left, and I imagine there has to be lingering stuff. Nah, you know, like, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, I, I don't consider myself a whistleblower. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I get significant uh, support, as I said. And actually, after I did what I did, and after, you know, fighting with the CIA on torture and exposing what happened on 9-11 uh, with the 9-11 Commission, I was promoted inside the FBI. Um, so, um, so I don't consider myself like a living martyr or, you know, I, I'm, I'm complaining about uh, what happened to, to me. Um, I stood up for what I believe was the right thing to do. Um, and um, I don't regret at all what I did. Uh, again, this is America. After all these years, now people know the truth and know what happened. 
we had the 9-11 commission that came to the same conclusion that, uh, you know, I told them. Uh, we had uh, on the torture debate, we have the Armed Services Committee under Senator McCain. They came up with the same conclusion as well. The CIA Inspector General report in 2004 came up with the same conclusion. Um, the uh, Senate Select Committee of Intelligence report, they came up with the same conclusion. And now finally the black banners has been unredacted and people can know the truth. So, um, you know, it makes me believe in our system. It makes me believe in our government. It makes me believe in the ideals that we were talking about at the beginning um, of this podcast. Um, look, you know, I continue to do a lot of work. I'm sure you mentioned some of the threats that I'm getting today, I continue to get from Al-Qaeda, from white supremacists, from, uh, from the Saudis, <laughs> our friends, the Saudis. Um, but also at the same time, I continue to expose things. I mean, we were the very first entity uh, the Safan Center to expose ISIS and uh, put uh, the whole the whole uh, structure of ISIS uh, back before ISIS was uh, you know a big name, and uh, we talked about the foreign fighters before anybody talked about the foreign fighters to the point that the U.S. government and the British government were using our numbers initially on the U.S. fighter foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria. Um, we have been on the forefront of the disinformation. Um, you know, threat from Russia, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other countries. Um, we talked about the threat of white supremacy, and I testify about this threat before the FBI and the State Department and DHS even acknowledged it. And we put the threat, uh, uh, you know, uh, front and center, even um, in the Trump administration. And uh, we had a bipartisan support, a very rare bipartisan support in the Homeland Security Committee where Republicans and Democrats agree uh, that we need to pay attention and U.S. agencies need to pay attention uh, on the threat of white supremacy and the global network of white supremacy. So I continue on the fight. And we do a lot of pro bono work on the side, me and my colleagues, to bring American hostages back home. And probably you heard our name mentioned um, with bringing the two Beatles, the people who executed and kidnapped American hostages in Syria. Uh, to the United States and our work with the families. And recently we had a success in bringing uh, uh, an American hostage um, who was held illegally in Yemen by the Houthis back to the United States. So look, you know, my, my point here is when you take an oath to defend uh, this great country, uh, that oath does not stop with a paycheck. You took an oath in front of God and God does not recognize the paycheck that you're getting. And I believe that I'm blessed that I have the capabilities, I have the resources, thankfully. And we continue to do the fight from outside and help the people who need help inside. Because I know how difficult it is when you're inside and, and you don't have people to help you sometimes. Or we don't have people to, to basically say publicly in the outside what's happening in the inside. And we're very happy that we are very well trusted, regardless if it's the Obama administration or it's the Bush administration, or it is the Trump administration. We have that position, and um, and we have this kind of relationship, and we know that people, you know, who are in these institutions are fighting the good fight. So we try to ignore the politics as much as we can, and focus on what's better for this nation. And hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, we'll uh, we'll get over the difficult times we're living these days. Well, you know, that that kind of sums up my follow-up and answers it. And I just want to say that, you know, I, I was kind of inspired by the end of the book, you know, when you talked about continuing the fight. And it's clear that you have. And there's a veterans organization that does a lot of community work. I believe they're called, you know, the Mission Continues or something. And uh, yeah. and there's a lot of ways to do that. And, and, and we try to contribute in our small way through activism and it sounds like you're doing so much after taking off you know i guess you can't maybe say the uniform but the 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 suit but i liked how you ended black banners talking about your your new hobby of you know getting to the root of these issues countering propaganda and rhetoric that you know these terrorist groups use to incite entice people you know so you don't have to go find them and that was that was really 
great and you keep fighting which does give hope in what can be kind of dark times right now and it's clear from everything you've said and throughout your work that there's this distinct sense that you've never submitted to apathy nihilism or despair and that's uh that's a that's a rare thing and a nice to be able to end on a hopeful note and uh Ali, I just want to thank you so much and, and say that this has been a far more, I think, enlightening discussion than, than even some of our best guests and certainly than one hears in most, you know, short form media settings. So um, that's just really great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Henry, for, for giving me the opportunity. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be with you guys and thank you for your service. And uh, I think we need to, we need to keep uh, the fight um, in uh, from whatever we are, we, we continue to, to, to fight for the truth, to fight for this nation, to fight for the ideals that um, we lost a lot of buddies and friends, uh, you know, on the battlefield fighting for these things. So, Absolutely. And uh, for the listeners, definitely check out Black Banners as well as his other book, Anatomy of Terror. Uh, check out the group webpage. All of it's well worth the read. There's publications and appearances posted there and um you know just just keep up with the fight i uh, hope everyone enjoyed the interview and ali thanks again and hopefully we'll maintain a relationship uh moving forward between the pod and yourself and any way we can work together absolutely thank you very much it's a great pleasure being with you guys we're on twitter at fortress on a hill and also at facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not.